So we're going to continue our discussion of oxidation numbers um, today, and we're going to look at how they are discovered in covalent bonds. So the important thing to remember is that covalent, bo covalent bonds don't really have charges like ionic bonds do. So the oxidation numbers are created by scientists. And they're basically created by chemists to track the movement of electrons in uh, reactions that have covalent bonds. Now there's lots of evidence that this uh, react that electrons move in reactions with covalent bonds. Um, so chemists decided that they would sort of had to come up with a system to systematically track the movement of electrons so they could better understand how the reactions actually work. Now the rules that we're going to use are set out and they're fairly straightforward. So the first rule we're going to look at is the oxidation number of an atom in its pure form as an element is zero. So um, its pure form is basically the form that you find on the periodic table. Now hopefully you remember that basically is the, um, the state is the color provided on the periodic table, so a blue would be a liquid, red is a gas, and then the very common black is a solid. So for example, something like iron in its solid state would have an oxidation number of zero. Um, same for something like hydrogen gas or um, bromine liquid. So all of these are in their standard state and ha as a result have an oxidation number of zero. Now the important thing to know about oxidation numbers is that what you've previously learned about them or previously learned about ions is still true for ionization energies and things along charge along lines of charges. Um, so when we're looking at sort of assigning oxidation numbers for ionic compounds, the charges of the ions in our ionic bond is basically what we've learned previously. Um, the, another, I guess, um, consequence of this is the first point that's written down here is that monoatomic ions have a charge on them, so that's why they're monoatomic ions, and their oxidation number is simply that value. So for example, if you have something like Cl minus, the oxidation number, really no surprise, is just minus one. Um, but I guess the slightly more difficult thing is just remembering that the charges that we learned previously, so something like magnesium chloride, the um, oxidation number on the magnesium, magnesium being an alkaline metal, or alkaline earth metal, excuse me, is in the second group, so it's going to have a charge of plus two, and the chlorine is going to have a minus one charge. Um, it's the same for any ionic compound, so anything that you can dream up. So we'll use magnesium again. Magnesium oxide, which the oxidation number on the magnesium is two plus. The oxidation number on the oxygen is two minus, just as we've learned in previous courses. Now, some of ugh, some of the um, elements are going to have common oxidation numbers. So we're going to be starting to talk now about covalent compounds. So the common oxidation number for hydrogen is plus one. So that means that most compounds that hydrogen is found in, so for example, methane, the oxidation number of the hydrogen is going to be plus one. Same and another fairly common compound that we have hydrogen in, water. The oxidation for the hydrogen is going to be plus one. Um, as we look at slightly more less common um, compounds containing hydrogen, you will find that hydrogen always has an oxidation of plus one. 
this is one of those things that we're going to use to help us solve for um, oxidation numbers of other elements uh, as we move through this sort of lesson. Now there is one exception for this. Um, when hydrogen is in a metal hydride, it's going to have a minus one charge. Now you might be wondering, how do I tell if it's in a metal hydride? There's a very simple um, clue to that. Basically, the hydrogen is with a metal. So in this case here, we have lithium hydride. The charge on the hydrogen is going to be minus one. Um, magnesium hydride. Again, you'll notice it's with a metal, minus one. Okay, moving on down to the oxygen. Now oxygen, again, has a common um, oxidation number. So going back to our example of water, we actually know the oxidation numbers of both of these elements. We know that the hydrogen is going to be plus one. And what I'm saying here is that the common oxidation number for oxygen is minus two. So with a few exceptions, oxygen is generally minus two. So in water, minus two. Um, we look at something like, I don't know, methanol. Um, in methanol, we have a carbon, four hydrogens, and an oxygen. The oxidation number for the hydrogen is going to be plus one in both cases. So even though they're, it's written here separately, the oxidation number for all of these is the same, plus one. And the oxygen is going to be minus two. Um, we're going to figure out later in the lesson how to deal with the carbon. Now, it's important to know that oxidation numbers... are are per atom is the per atom value not the total this is just sort of a side note to what we're dealing with right now but that is um, the case now Oxygen has two exceptions. Exception number one. Uh, the first exception is when oxygen is bonded with fluorine. So the uh, oxygen difluoride example. So this is the one exception for oxygen, or one of the exceptions for oxygen. Um, and it goes back to the electronegativity um, decision making with uh, oxidation numbers. Uh, fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen, therefore it's going to pull the electrons to itself more closely, and as a result oxygen is going to be plus two. Um, we don't really talk about it here in the lesson, but uh, fluorine, because it's the most electronegative um, element on the periodic table, it always is going to have an oxidation number of minus one, but because it's not found in very many um, covalent compounds, we don't really talk that much about it, or it doesn't really provide much help in terms of solving for our unknown uh, oxidation numbers like the carbon here that, as of right now, we don't know how to deal with, but we will learn shortly. The other exception is um, in peroxides. Now, peroxides are oxygen-containing compounds that have essentially one more oxygen than they're supposed to. So common examples are um, sodium peroxide, um, hydrogen peroxide um, are really the, the common ones, hydrogen peroxide being the most common. Now we know in hydrogen peroxide that the charge will be plus one, or oxidation number, excuse me, on the hydrogen will be plus one. Now um, because it's a peroxide, we have to recognize that fact and assign the oxidation number of minus one to the oxygen. Same in sodium peroxide. Um, the oxygen is going to have a minus one charge. Now sodium being a metal indicates that this is going to be an ionic bond, so the charge on the sodium will be what we remember from grade 11, hopefully, which is plus one. So moving on, you'll see that the statement here, the combination of nonmetals, the oxidation number of the um, more electronegative atom is negative. The oxidation number of the least electronegative uh, number, or excuse me, the least electronegative number is going to be a positive um, oxidation number. Now, this sort of makes sense, and to be honest, the rules that we're going to sort of look at take a lot of this into account and sort of remove this 
from our thinking. So we don't really have to worry too, too much about this. Now, I uh, mentioned earlier that some elements in covalent compounds, we're not going to know their uh, oxidation number. And in fact, many of the elements uh, will have three or four different oxidation numbers that they could possibly have. Now, we're going to use some pretty simple algebra to help us solve um, for our unknown elements. So example seven, or question seven, or statement seven here has an example, and it's a fairly common uh, type of problem. So we have um, sulfuric acid. Now, in sulfuric acid, we know the oxidation number of two of the elements. So we should recognize the fact that there's hydrogen in it, and that hydrogen commonly has an oxidation number of plus one, and oxygen is also in it, and oxygen typically has an oxidation number of minus two. Now, that does leave us with um, sulfur, which, as of right now, we're not certain what its oxidation number is going to be. So we're not certain what that is, so we'll just give it the variable x, like anything we would do in a math class when we're not certain about its value or the sum of it. Now, the statement here is basically what we're going to be doing. So it says here the algebraic sum of the oxidation numbers is going to be equal to zero for compounds. So if we have a polyatomic compound, the sum of our algebraic, um, excuse me, the algebraic sum of our oxidation numbers is going to give us an uh, answer of zero. So let's take a look at what we have here. In our compound, we have how many hydrogens? It looks like we have two hydrogens and four oxygens, along with just a single sulfur. Now what we're going to do is set up a algebraic equation that takes into account the oxidation numbers of all of these different elements and will allow us to solve for the oxidation number of the unknown, or sulfurs. So we have two hydrogens, each with an oxidation number or oxidation number value of plus one. Uh, we have a single hydrogen, or excuse me, a single sulfur with an unknown oxidation value. And finally, we have four oxygens with oxidation numbers of minus two. Now, what we're going to do is set all of this equal to zero because it's a polyatomic compound. And then we're just going to solve for x. So two times one is two, plus one times x is x plus four times negative two is gonna be negative eight. So x plus two minus eight equals zero. So the a value of the oxidation number for sulfur, instead of running that as a x, we can now change it to Six. So we now know the value of our unknown element. Okay, so we can take this further and um, also do it for polyatomic ions. Now, it's the exact same process. So in a minute, you can pause this if you'd like and just try it yourself. Again, we're going to be making um, a small algebra equation. So again, we've got the algebraic sum of oxidation numbers is going to be equal to something. Now, in this case, because it's not a compound, but an ion instead, the, um, the sum of our oxidation numbers is going to be equal to the charge on our ion. So because we have an ion, instead of it equaling zero, equaling zero, it's going to equal the charge on the ion. So in this case here, we have um, a form of phosphoric acid. And our phosphoric acid has a minus one charge. So we're going to set up our equation in the exact same manner, except that instead of equaling zero, our equation is going to equal minus one. Okay, so if you want to try this on your own, I'd suggest pausing it right now. Uh, if you want to watch me solve it, and then try, you've got a bunch of practice problems that follow, you can do that as well. So let me just do this real quick. So hydrogen plus one, phosphorus I'm not sure about, that's going to be x, and the oxygen is minus two. Now notice that I'm writing the, again, the oxidation numbers are the value per atom, not the overall 
we're going to have to determine our overall over here at the side. So it's going to be the same process. So I've got two hydrogens with a plus one charge each. I've got a single phosphorus. So I'm just going to write that as a single X. Four oxygen minus two. So two plus X minus eight. Now, again, this is where the difference is. Instead of equaling 0, like it was in the previous example, it's going to equal minus 1. So x minus 6 equals minus 1. x will equal 5. And we have now solved for our unknown oxidation number. So following this are um, several practice problems. And there are, I think there is I guess there's three three questions in total. Um, the following slide or page will have um, all the answers for these. Um, the actual assigning of oxidation numbers is going to be the most important part of electrochemistry because without assigning your oxidation numbers, you're not going to be able to follow um, the movement of electrons through the reactions. So it's going to be very important that you try all of these questions and understand them. All right, so please try them before taking them up. If you have any questions, of course, contact me.